Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's video, we discuss countries of origins, what they mean for you as a consumer, what I can tell you, and what they can't tell you. In today's world, you can buy just about any product that was constructed woven, assembled, fabricated, designed in a specific country. Many brands stake their reputations on the country of origin. But in a globalized world where materials come from different parts and are assembled in many places, how much can a single country of origin really tell you? Most people still like to believe that if the label says made in the US, it's entirely made in the US. However, that's oftentimes not the case. It just means that the majority of the parts was actually made or assembled in the US. Sometimes, of course, there's a label fraud going on and the thing that is made in the US may actually not be made in the US at all. In my experience, making an informed decision solely based on the made in designation is basically impossible in this day and age. Even if you're at a store and you ask the staff where something is made and they insist that this pocket square was made in Ireland, chances are that the linen wasn't actually from Ireland and it was maybe woven in Ireland, but the hand stitching was made somewhere else as well. The fact of the matter is the sales clerks and staff don't know much about the supply chains of the brands they sell. And because of that, they can't really tell you where something is made in its entirety. So obviously there are different rules of what you can and can't say on labels. So let's take a closer look of what made in means in the US. The Federal Trade Commission, also known as FTC, requires that you don't just have the country of origin, but also the fiber content, as well as wash instructions and the manufacturer or brand label. That being said, those labeling requirements do not apply until the product goes to sale to the consumer. So you could import something without a label and then put something on after the fact just before it's sold to the consumer. That's also true for garments. So they can be delivered to the US in part or almost completed and then some work can be done in the US and it can be labeled made in the US. In the EU, for example, the fabric composition is required, but country of origin is not. Now, while it all seems pretty straightforward, sometimes people don't say the truth. However, the bigger problem is globalization, because from a single sticker, it's hard to infer what went into that product. Why? Well, country of origin is simply a very simplified approach to a globalized world. Just think of a car, for example. The cost of designing the car, engineering the car, and testing it are huge expenses that may not be at all in a place where a car is manufactured. On top of that, a car is assembled of many different parts from many different vendors, many different countries. And so again, the development of all of that and where it's manufactured are two very different things. For example, in 2018, the Jeep Cherokee was the most American car with apparently 72% of the parts being made or assembled in the US. Now, Jeep is owned by Fiat, which is an Italian company, which is headquartered in London, England. Of course, if the part was designed in Italy and then made or assembled in the US, then it's still counted as being an American part. Now, it seems obvious that cars are complex, but even clothing or simple accessories, such as a tie, a pair of gloves, or a pocket square, also have a globalized supply chain. For example, let's take a look at one of our Ford Bevelator ties. 98% of the world's raw silk today originates in China. That also means that the best quality silk these days comes from China. And because we're all about quality, we get our raw material silk from China. The raw material silk is then spun into a yarn and woven into a fabric. That can happen either in China or in Italy or in England. If it's a jacker tie and it's woven, that's the finished fabric, that's it. Typically, that happens in Italy. Now, if the fabric is printed, it comes to England and it's a very complicated dye and discharge printing mechanism that is very labor intensive and very costly and it's hand screen printed on screens in England. Now, because the printing process is labor intensive and expensive, you could call this entire fabric made in England, even though the raw material, the yarn, as well as the woven part of the fabric were all made in China. So now with the fabric, we have to make a tie. We checked many different manufacturers in different countries and we found it in Vietnam. We got a really high level of skill and craftsmanship, 
paired with a relatively low price and a very consistent output. So even though a tie may say it's 100% made out of silk, it usually has some form of interlining, made out of cotton or wool or both. The interlining for four validator ties comes from Italy. It is made out of wool of Australian or New Zealand sheep. The thread we use comes from a renowned German company and it is made out of 100% silk, which again comes as a raw material from China. Now, we sew and cut our ties in Vietnam, but because the printing process of the fabric is so expensive, we could technically call this entire tie made in England, even though just the printing actually happened in England. Isn't that crazy? We thought so too. Most people assume that a made in label will tell you where a product was actually cut and assembled or made. Because of that, we put a made in Vietnam label into our ties and bow ties. Now, obviously, as you can see, there are all these different steps from different countries that make something more expensive, but we do it because we believe in the quality of the final product. Of course, we could also try to do everything in one country. The problem is, if you want to have a silkworm production in England, and then also spinning a the yarn there and weaving it, not only is it going to be a lot more expensive, but chances are the quality would also be lower. The point I'm trying to make here is that it is impossible to simply ascertain the real journey of a product and how it came to life simply by looking at that small made-in label. The same is true for gloves. For example, the raw hides for our lamb Napa gloves come from Ethiopia, which are then tanned in Italy. Our pack reel letter comes from Peru, which is then tanned in Germany. We'll send it off to Hungary because of a great tradition of glove making, but the interlining comes from Italy. But the cashmere comes originally from Mongolia. Thread again comes from Germany. We call it made in Hungary because that's where the people sit, where they cut the gloves, where they sew them together. For peccary though, it's so expensive and it's tanned in Germany that we could technically call it made in Germany. Even something as small and simple as a pocket square is not straightforward. Assume it's a silk pocket square, the silk fabric comes from China, it is then printed in Italy or in England, and then some manufacturers just ship it to the Azores or Morocco or some other Northern African countries with a low labor cost where they get hand rolled and sent back, but then they have a made in Italy or made in England label in there. I find that's really not what actually happened there, but legally, you're totally in your right to do that. We started for Belvedere. I traveled the world and saw many manufacturing facilities, and sometimes they would just plainly lie and put a Made in Germany label in there, even though the entire production took place in Vietnam. Frankly, I find that quite disheartening, especially if you look at local regulations, such as in California, where they require that all of the assembly is made in the US in order to label it made in the US. Now, the rules on a federal level are a little different, because on a federal level, you can have a Made in the US label if it is all or virtually all made in the US. In California, though, it has to be 100% made in the US. But what does that mean, for example, for a tie? I'm not aware of any domestic silk production facility with the silkworms being here in the US. So can no tie ever truly be made in the US? As a consumer, keep in mind that these Made in labels are typically used by companies to justify a higher price from the consumer because they automatically assume that a made in the US product is more expensive than a made in China product. Years ago, I did a factory visit at the Shinola factory in Detroit, and I was surprised to see so many made in China parts because a big selling point of their brand was this whole made in Detroit message. To learn more about it, please check out this post here. Now, that being said, if you see a country of origin label and it's in a first world country, chances are there are certain elements that are better for the environment or for the workers who made that product. Now, low GDP countries like Sri Lanka, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic or Bangladesh are often used by fast fashion companies because they can subcontract a manufacturer who makes those things and they don't really have to worry about the conditions people are working under. You may recall that in recent years, Bangladesh had frequent issues with fires and workers dying because safety regulations weren't on top of mind of the subcontractor. Now, manufacturers often claim that they don't know what the subcontractors do, or that they were promised one thing, but they did another. At the end of the day, it's a murky system that's at best obscure. And it's one of the reasons why even big companies like Nike have a hard time telling you exactly what their entire supply chain looks like and how people are involved from start to finish and where all the products are coming from. 
Of course, if you're a company that swears by manufacturing in Canada or in the US or in Germany or elsewhere, you can at least assume that they care about a certain level of environmental standards, worker safety, and sometimes also the quality of their products. Of course, that being said, I've seen excellent quality products come out of Sri Lanka, especially in the clothing realm. So just because something is a low GDP country doesn't mean the quality can't be there. On the other hand, in a first world country, you will likely have minimum wages. You have certain laws that regard the work time and the work hours and the capacities. And those laws are typically also more often enforced. Also in countries with a lower GDP, oftentimes there's less oversight on an environmental impact and subcontractors or owners of companies are less inclined to follow the rules. For example, if you go to the center of the denim production in China, you can see rivers that are blue because of all the dark blue denim color. That being said, you can also go to the US and look at 3M and some of their manufacturing facilities and they have leaked bad substances into the water and people were harmed by it. So just because you're in a first world country doesn't mean that companies will always obey environmental regulations or will do no harm to the environment or people close to their factories. Now, a median label can sometimes also indicate the heritage quality of a certain country. For example, Hungary is known for glove production, classic men's dress shoes, and of course, paprika. Hungarian paprika is known to be of quality and tasty. In Germany, a town like Solingen is famous for their cutlery, and Glashütte is known for watchmaking. Same is true with cars. A car that is made in Germany has likely a higher expectation and warrants a higher price than a car made in Romania or Asia. England has a long-standing tailoring tradition. They've been weaving silk and printing silk for centuries, and they've even little towns like Northampton where you find lots of shoe factories. Italians are known for their leather goods and leather tanning, for their clothing, and for their cashmere goods. So are the Scots. I could go on and on about different countries and what they're known for. And while it's generally true that you find a higher level of quality if there's a centralized industry around a certain good, there are also sometimes people who try to cut corners and benefit from that general perception of quality. Based on these preconceptions, we sometimes are in the illusion that low-cost countries will only produce fast fashion and well-known countries will just produce quality. Reality is that's not always true. Just the other day, I looked at a pair of Merman shoes that are made in China, and they're of very high quality because a lot of know-how from the Carmina family from Spain went into that shoe. On the other hand, I had a German Bosch microwave, which just sucked. At the end of the day, I think if you look hard enough, you can find quality and crap in every country. Or for example, just look at Leica, which is the most profitable camera maker in the world today. They charge really high prices, and part of that is justified with being manufactured and designed in Germany, which is something they push hard in their marketing materials. Now, they make a good product, and they're smart people, so they looked at the rules very closely, and they put up a 560,000 square foot production facility in Portugal. Now, if you look at their products, nothing ever says made in Portugal at all. Yet, a lot of the parts and cameras are made in Portugal just to the point where they're shipped off to Germany, probably finished off, so they can legally be called designed and manufactured in Germany. Now, does that mean that a Leica camera that is partially made in Portugal is better or worse? No, it doesn't. It's probably the same quality, but just something to keep in mind. Now, the GDP in Portugal is a lot lower than in Germany, and I suspect that's the reason why Leica built that plant there in the first place. As a consumer, you don't always know where these cost savings go. Do they go towards customer service, maybe an improved product, maybe marketing, or maybe just as profit on the books? Fortunately, I have the perspective from both sides. On the one hand, I'm a consumer. On the other hand, a manufacturer, because we produce all of our own products and design them ourselves. Both at Ford Belvedere and Gentleman's Gazette, we firmly believe in quality, and because of that, that's what we strive for. We also believe that a high quality product can be made anywhere in the world, and so we try to get a really high quality product at a fair price. Of course, we want our workers to earn a fair wage. We don't want them to be overworked, we want them to have time to be with their families, and we want to protect and respect the environment. Sadly, that's not something that can be communicated on a simple label. If you really want to display the entire journey of the product and everything that goes into it, you need a little novel next to it, or you make videos about it or talk about it. So in a nutshell, what can a country's of origin label tell you? 
The answer is not much. Maybe it can give you a hint about the quality and where it was made, but it's not always true. And it really just gives you a small glimpse into what actually happened. So ideally, always talk to the brands you buy from, understand what they do, where their stuff is coming from, how it's made, and don't just look at the origin label. In today's video, I'm wearing a vintage tweed jacket, which is made in England. My shirt, I don't even know where it's made from. It is made from an Italian fabric with a blue checked pattern. I think it was made in Asia somewhere. My boutonniere was made of a German fabric and made in Germany. My pocket square is made of a silk wool blend with a raw silk coming from China, the wool from New Zealand. It is printed in England and hand rolled in England. Both of these are Fort Belvedere and you can find them in our shop here. My pair of corduroys was made in the Dominican Republic by Ralph Lauren. They're brown and I'm combining them with a pair of Trickers boots in a really nice tan color, which were made in England from English leather. I'm pairing them with a Fort Belvedere belt in a tan color, which has leather on the top that comes from Alpine cows, which is tanned in Germany. The inside lining is Italian leather, Safiano leather, which is green and comes from Italy. The buckle is also from Italy, solid press that is gold plated, with the gold, I'm not quite sure where it's coming from because it's really hard to trace the origin of your gold. But you can see it's a product that has ingredients from many different countries and it is then hand sewn in Portugal. Last but not least, I'm wearing shadow stripe socks from Fort Belvedere, which are made and knitted in Italy, but the original cotton comes actually from Egypt. All those accessories can be found in our shop here, but you can see even in my outfit, there's so many different countries involved and you'd be hard pressed to just say, oh, this is made in Italy or in England or there because so much goes into it.